Amen. Well, welcome home, everyone. And I want to welcome all of you joining us here in person and the many of you joining us online and by phone uh, this morning. God is good. And all the time. Amen. I want to read Psalm 121. It says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is the shade at your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Amen. Amen. If you have the strength to stand, I invite you to stand this morning. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we gather together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints fell down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the Shine through the shadows. 
Caminos, cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. Milagroso, abres caminos, cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. Aquí estás, tocando mi corazón. Grosso, abres caminos, cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. Milagroso, milagroso, abres caminos, cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. Light in the darkness, my God. That 
Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Milagroso, abres camino, cumples promesas, usen tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. Milagroso. Milagroso, abres caminos, cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú, así eres tú, así eres tú, así eres tú, así eres tú. Amen. Does anybody have a testimony and you just want to share something God has been doing in your life? I just got back from a trip to Kansas City, and I have to tell you, every moment of my trip was ordered by the Lord, and it was phenomenal to see what God was up to every step of the way. It's incredible. My uncle, he is... um, he, his kidneys have failed, so he's on dialysis uh, three days a week, four hours each day. And you know, that doesn't stop him. That doesn't discourage him. He didn't complain. In fact, he said, let's go. <laughs> and here he is. He's leading worship at their church. He fell down, right, because he's unstable At mealtime, he would get kind of sick to his stomach, you know, but he's the district treasurer for the Joplin district. He kept going. He didn't complain once. And we were at the Laura Ingalls Wilder home in Missouri, Mansfield, Missouri. And there was one little shuttle that was running in between the homes because he could hardly walk. And wouldn't you know, When we walked out of the museum, the shuttle was just emptying out, and it was ready for us, just at the exact time. And he said, this happens all the time, because God is good. Amen? Amen. Anybody else have a testimony? Okay. You know, and it's unbelievable to me how God opened the door for me. The service was in the morning, which meant if I made it back before 5 o'clock at night, I could go because I had a meeting at 5. And the the service was in Hutchinson, Kansas at 1030 in the morning. The timing of, of God was just perfect. I made it back to my hotel by 430 was able to meet my, go to my meeting at five, and the Lord just had me there to support Dave and Sandy, and it was a beautiful thing how the Lord worked despite the difficult circumstances, so God is good. What are, what are the chances that I would be back there at just that exact time? And what are the chances? God is good all the time. All Amen. Amen. God is good all the time. Anybody else have a testimony? You just want to praise the Lord. Amen. Yes. Yes. Well, the lady that we brought from Colorado, um, she's a believer, but she still needs to get back with the Lord. 
Yes. And um, she just got such an awesome blessing. And when she hugged Dawn and I and saw us, she really loved us and to thank her, you know, to thank us for bringing her back here, it just made me feel so good because I know God is working upon her. And and so, you know, she, she wants to come to church, but she can't with all the pain that she's in. Yes. And Okay. And um, Mary is an awesome person, and I think little by little, she changes every day, and I can see that. And now that food has been put into her body more and more, she goes, I'm going on a diet. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't weigh but 80 pounds. Let's get her home. You know what she looks like. She does. And um, she is beginning to spell out a little more. Mm. And Wow. Every time we used to be here, and she's out there on the porch just praising the Lord. And it is just so awesome to see that God has put us in her life to bring her back here. Yes. Praise the Lord. I love how God sent you to Colorado to go help your friend who was drinking rainwater because she had no clean water. It's amazing. What a testimony. Praise the Lord. Anybody else want to give God glory? Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Just want to give glory to God. Yes, Glenda. Amen. 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 God uses everything, doesn't he? Even the hard stuff. Yes, amen. Anybody else want to give God praise this morning? Okay, <laughs> Roberta and Linda. <laughs> Yes. Amen. Amen. That's what God does. Yes. So good. Thank you, Roberta. Linda. Oh. Yeah. And are you Linda too? Oh, well, welcome. You have a testimony. I love it. We'd love to hear it. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes.
Yes. Oh, I love that. Praise the Lord. Thank you for sharing. Oh, good. I've got cousins everywhere. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you for being here. That's special. Yeah, and Linda. Yes. Amen. 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 So good. verse I want to invite you if you'd like to come and kneel at the altars this morning they're always open and Jim and Jerry are going to come and pray for us right now This is Acts um, chapter 6, 1 through 15. Seven men chosen to serve. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their windows were being, their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 called a meeting of all the believers, they said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so brothers, select seven men who are well respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this rep responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea and they chose the following Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread the number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Stephen is arrested. 
Stephen, a man, of full, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. But one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it was called, started to, ba to debate with him. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia, and the province of Asia. None of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, we heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. This roused the people, the elders, and the teachers of religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. The lying witnesses said, this man is always speaking against the holy temple and against the law of Moses. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs Moses handed down to us. At this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel's. Amen. 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 Right, let us pray. Father God, we just thank you and give you the glory of this day and thank you for your presence that we can feel and know that you are here with us today. We just give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Well, is there anybody here who likes to be overlooked or forgotten or put off to the side? You know, there was a time when I was volunteering at a church in Nampa, Idaho. You guys are familiar here. We have some some Idaho friends here, and I was at this church, and there was this teenage girl. She was not very old, and she was standing in the gymnasium off by herself, and nobody seemed to be noticing her. So I went up to this girl and began building a friendship with her and reaching out to her and you know, um, I was a student at Northwest Nazarene University, and, and they had um, student days where um, high school students could come and stay with us on campus. So I invited her. I said, why don't you come stay with me and my roommate? You can come with me to classes and get to know, you know, the school a little bit and spend time with us. And she had such a great time being there with us. And one night... She just kind of opened her heart, and she was this young girl. She said her mother was dying of cancer, and her mother could hardly breathe, was fighting for each breath at home. And my heart just broke for her, and she said, yeah, and there's something I want to tell my mom, but I don't feel like it's right because she's almost gone and I don't want to put this on her, but she shared a situation where her innocence was taken away. And so I, I helped her. I, I encouraged her. I got her into some counseling, helped to support her. And then I went to her mom's funeral and sat with her and walked with her through the dark days of grief of her mom's death and the loss of her innocence. And it was hard. But there came a time a couple years later that she found me and she thanked me for seeing her when no one else saw her. Off on the corner of the room, no one talked to her. You know, no one likes to be overlooked. You know, we, we praise God because we serve the God who sees. Remember Hagar? She was kind of thrown out by Sarah, and Hagar was off in the desert alone, and she said, she said, Lord, you are El Roy. You are the God who sees me when I'm, like, crumpling inside, right? Sometimes God gives us eyes to see what God sees. 
And God sees you today, no matter what circumstance you're in or have gone through. Verse 1 says, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So Hellenistic Jews were Greek-speaking Jews. And then the other Jews spoke Hebrew. So we had Greeks and Hebrews, right? The language is happening. And I don't know if maybe this was a language barrier, right? That, that the Greek-speaking Jews were forgotten. But, but the disciples uh, were increasing it and this complaint arose to say, hey, don't forget us. Don't forget us. It's kind of like I was back in... Um, in Olathe, Kansas, visiting my friends who have now quilted 1,112 quilts for Project Linus, which is, uh, they want to make 10,000 quilts for all the children there who are in need. And, and they said, you know, one of the challenges of our school district is we have 86 languages in our, in our school district. You know, and so sometimes when there's a language bar barrier, people can get overlooked, but not in this church. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. We don't let a little language stop us from interacting in the Holy Spirit. Amen. And, and maybe the barrier, the language barrier kept them um, from helping each other. But what, what we do know is the Greek-speaking Jews complained against the Hebrew-speaking Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. You know that prayer we pray, pray as the Lord taught us to pray, and we say, give us this day our daily bread, right? We are to care for the widows and the orphans. You know, I love Pat and Sandy's story of, of throughout their life and ministry, they brought hundreds and helped hundreds of, of foster kids in their family. I love Carlina's story that she was able to share uh, with us, that she brought in hundreds of foster kids from here in Lincoln City into her family and helped them. And we, there are so many stories. We could spend all day sharing stories about how each and every one of you has been faithful in caring for people, right? It's really special. We have such a caring church. And in this situation, these widows were being overlooked. In verse 2, so the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. You know, they, they made a boundary. They, they said, you know, our job is to preach the word. And, you know, sometimes when there's a problem, right, everybody wants to go fix the problem. Well, if they had left to fix the problem, then they would have been neglecting the word of God. It's interesting how that works, huh? So in other words, pastors have their job to study and share the word of God, and it's up to the church to take care of the needs. So together, they created a plan, right? Verse 3, therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we may put in charge of this task. So they chose seven responsible people, seven people with godly character who were full of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and had wisdom. You know, physical food is a separate need from spiritual food, but both are needed, right? Both are needed. The disciples made a, a boundary. Their primary calling was to be devoted to prayer and the ministry of the word, which meant they needed to study the word and preach the word. In verse 4, they said, but we will devote ourselves or give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. 
the disciples were saying we cannot overlook the word of God. It is our calling, it is our primary task to be faithful to preach the word of God no matter what other needs are around us. You know, for my 20, now 20 years of ministry, I have made a boundary on my Tuesday. Every Tuesday is my sermon day and I block out the whole day just to focus and studying the word of God you know, because it's important. I don't want to neglect deep study of the Word of God in preparation for today. And then, of course, ever since I was 12 years old, I spend time every morning talking to Jesus, right, in prayer, studying the Word, growing deeper. I, I pray for you, all of you by name. I pray for my family. I pray for those in authority over me. I, I pray for missionaries. I pray for so many things. But you know what's been interesting in the last 10 or so years is the Lord has said, I want to talk to you. And so now my prayer time, more than anything, I spend listening. Just listening to what the Spirit is saying. And, and I love how the Lord directs my steps. Every step, it's amazing. Prayer is just a conversation. And hopefully it's a two-way conversation for you where at least half the time you're able to listen because Jesus has a lot to tell you. He wants to share and it, it will never go against God's word. He is faithful in that. And these apostles said, we cannot neglect praying we cannot neglect the word. It's, it's important. So verse 5, the statement found approval with the whole congregation. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. So the whole church was in agreement that the pastor's job was to preach and to pray. And they could choose seven people to work, do the work of feeding physically and helping physically. And notice in this list of seven, Stephen is kind of highlighted, right? A man full of faith, right? What does it look like to be full of faith? Well, let's look at what it's not, right? It's not someone who is complaining, arguing, or fighting. Being full of faith is not someone who demands their own way. It's not someone who focuses on the world. But to be full of faith is walking in life with the calm assurance that God goes before you. God goes before me. Being full of faith is believing God can help us in impossible situations, with impossible obstacles. You know, I was back in Kansas City. My, the whole reason for my trip was we had a strategic vision planning session. They said, in the USA and Canada, the church has been in decline since 2006, and we've declined by 26%. Only 10% of that is from uh, COVID and on. So it's a significant shift that's happened, and it's not just in the Church of the Nazarene. It's in every church, right, across the board. And we are people of faith and people who say God can do impossible things. And so we got together and, and uh, in the Church of Nazarene, we called upon half a million people to join us in prayer. And out of that half million people, 1,200 people wrote in responses about what God was saying to them. And it was huge, right? And it was all the same. It was, we need to trust God. We need to be full of faith. We need to move forward in the power of the Holy Spirit. Ooh, amen. Amen. And so my meeting back there, I was uh, in a small group with the president of Mid-America Nazarene University and one of our 
uh, district superintendents, and we were talking and praying and dreaming about what all this could look like if the Holy Spirit would help us. Because we believe the best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. The Holy Spirit is at work. Right? To be full of faith is a deep knowing in my heart of hearts that God is real, God heals, God restores, God provides, God supplies. It's a firm belief, persuasion, or conviction based on hearing the word of God. It's reliance. It's trust. It's God, I trust you. Even though I don't necessarily see how this can work out, I trust you that you're bigger. You're stronger. You are able. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to God must believe that God exists and God rewards those who earnestly or diligently seek him. Stephen was a man full of faith. That's the kind of person God desires that we all be is to have that faith that moves mountains. Amen. I, I love the story that Gene told when he was a little boy. He wasn't sure if God existed and how does this all work? And he heard that scripture that faith can move mountains. And so as a little boy, he said, move mountain, move mountain, move mountain. <laughs> and it wasn't too many years later that they actually brought out tractors and moved the mountain. <laughs> and God was showing himself real to Gene at a young age. Stephen was full also of the Holy Spirit. Right? He was discerning of the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to produce fruit of the Holy Spirit from Galatians 5, 22 and 23 of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. I loved Alice's Bible study of couple weeks ago on what happens when we combine the fruits of the Spirit. I had never thought about this before, but I thought it was so good. She said, joy plus peace equals tranquility or calm composure. Peace plus patience equals calm, long-suffering. Goodness and kindness equals compassion. Faithfulness and gentleness is sensitive strength. Goodness and self-control is righteousness. Joy, kindness, and gentleness equal tenderness. Love, goodness, and faithfulness equal justice. And patience added with faithfulness, added with self-control equals hanging in there. Right? The power of restraint. Stephen was full of all of that. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, which is much different than just being a nice person, right? It's growing in Christ-like character and becoming more like Jesus. It's amazing. Verse 6, and these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. You know, there's a reason that God instituted the laying on of hands, like praying for someone else. We were able to do that before our church service today as we prayed for Rich. You know, when, when we ordain a pastor in the Church of the Nazarene, after six to ten years of studying and examination through yearly interviews, there comes a day when we ordain them. And the general superintendent comes and the district superintendent comes and all the pastors lay their hands on this person to be ordained. And I'll never forget there was a, well, I'll call him a kid. You know, they get younger and younger. He was probably in his 20s. <laughs> and he uh, worked at South Salem Church of the Nazarene just an hour and a half away. And the thing that impressed me about him when we interviewed him, and this was his pastor bragging on him, said, you know, every morning when he gets to church, he comes and he kneels at the altar for an hour and prays before he starts his day. 
And I thought, that is so powerful and beautiful. I love that. And as I laid my hands on him, when he was ordained, my hands started burning as the fire of God was upon this young man who was faithful in his relationship with Jesus. These disciples laid their hands on the seven who would be in charge of daily food distribution. They were anointed to do the work of God through them. Verse 7 says, the word of God kept on spreading. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So the ministry was multiplied, and now the disciples could focus exclusively on the word of God and prayer, doing what God called them to do. And, and there was no doubt as more and more people would would have come to help with the daily food distribution and more people became disciples and did you hear this in this verse and a large number of priests right who were Jewish priests coming to the temple every day doing their sacrifices they started hearing about Jesus who was the ultimate sacrifice with his perfect blood and they became obedient to the faith. They received Christ into their hearts. They were changed. Now, this wasn't all the priests, right? But some of the priests were. It's amazing. Verse 8, and Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. So Stephen is growing more and more in the grace of God. And now it's not just Peter and Paul who are seeing miracles done through them. It's a lay person. Woo. You mean God can work through lay people? You don't have to, to be an ordained pastor for God to work through you? That's exactly right. Stephen was so filled with the Holy Spirit, he began seeing the miracles of God in and through him, and God was using him in powerful ways. Verse 9, but some of the men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. You know, when God is doing something powerful, just watch. Something will rise up against it. And this was no exception, right? I was able to say in, in the group, I said, you know, every pastor I talk to, they're under attack right now. Every church leader is under attack. And I was able to encourage several on my trip. And say, stand strong, stand firm in the Lord. Don't give up, keep moving forward. And I say to you today, stand strong in, in the Lord, stand firm in your faith, be filled with the Holy Spirit, keep moving forward. Amen? So now there rises up this other group coming against what God was doing. It was called the synagogue of the freedmen, who were Jews who had been taken captive to Rome by Pompey, uh, but were soon released. So they continued to live in Rome, but they decided to build their own synagogue in Jerusalem at their own expense. So when they came to Jerusalem, they would worship in their own synagogue. Well, the name Libertarians or Cyrenians refers to those who were born into captivity as opposed to the Jewish Romans who were born into freedom. So now we have another division of the Jewish people who oppose Stephen. Verse 10, but they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Mounts' interlinary translation says they couldn't oppose the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. They couldn't stand up against the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. This was a promise of Jesus being fulfilled, right? Luke 21, 15, Jesus said, For I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. 
the Holy Spirit was speaking through Stephen, and no one could stand up against the Holy Spirit. Why would they even want to try? Not a good idea, but they tried. Verse 11 says, Then they secretly induced or persuaded some of the men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Wow. They were lying. We know who the father of lies is. Right? Scripture says, never say anything in secret that you don't want shouted from the rooftops, because someday every word we've spoken will be shouted from the rooftops. Ooh. Wow. Verse 12, and they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the Sanhedrin. Stirred up the people, more rage, more jealousy, more join in the fight against these Christians. You know, and when you're in a cause like that, man, it's easy to get everybody fired up and everybody get angry and let's go after these Christians. But scripture tells us where to do a different kind of stirring up. To stir up the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Right? To encourage each other to grow in the fruits of the Spirit, not to stir up rage or fighting. Verse 13, they put forward false witnesses who said, this man or this fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law. Verse 14, for what we have heard him say, that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. It was a twisting of the truth, making it false. Stephen wouldn't have been speaking against Jerusalem. He wouldn't have been speaking about the city God loves. It wasn't Jesus who would destroy Jerusalem. Jesus said the temple would be destroyed, but he was talking about himself. Right? And then... The temple would be destroyed, but interestingly enough, it's by the people who were accusing Stephen. The Romans destroyed the temple. So the very people accusing Stephen, they, he, you know, they were the people who were destroying. Isn't that strange how that all works? <laughs> wow, they're blaming it on somebody else, but they themselves are the ones who did it. Verse 15, get this. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. At this point, Stephen hadn't even spoken one word in the court of law, but his face spoke volumes. He was shining Jesus. And this would have reminded them of the time Moses, when he came down the mountain after having received the law and his face was like the face of an angel, was super bright, and the people couldn't stand to look at him. Please cover your face. You're too bright. And for some of those there that day looking at Stephen, I wonder if that triggered in their mind about Moses. Was it not God's plan to remind them of Moses, who the Israelites opposed, and now Stephen, who they now oppose? But God was showing his blessing and his approval on Stephen and his ministry. He was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit and it just shined through. So here are the questions. Are you opposing anything that God is doing? And is anyone or anything being neglected in your own life? It's a good question to think about. You know, my prayer is that we'd, we would be so filled with the Holy Spirit 
so filled with faith that the Holy Spirit would just shine through. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word that is powerful and it changes us. It transforms our thinking. God, I'm so thankful that you see. You are the God who sees. You see the truth. You see what's really happening. You understand it. And Lord, I'm so thankful that you not only see us, but you walk with us through each and every moment. God, I just, I pray that if there's anyone here today who's been doing something, maybe consciously or unconsciously, to oppose you, Lord, we just, we say we're sorry, we repent. We want to stand strong with you and be close in our relationship with you. Lord, I'm so thankful for each and every person here. I pray that if we are neglecting anything or anyone around us, Lord, you just bring that person to mind. Help us to reach out and to be faithful. God, we love you today, and we're so, we're so thankful for the many ways you hear and answer our prayers. We love you, Jesus, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me if you can? Just take one eventiga, que extenda su amor, y te muestre favor. Dos te mire con agrado, y te de paz. The Lord bless you. May the Lord go with you in such a powerful way as you are full of faith. I love you all.